Okay, we're back for the five o'clock block today. And this is Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. We're talking about community matters today with John Friedman. And he is actually in Singapore. Say hi, John. Hey, good evening, everybody. Yeah, the title of our show today is, what is the title of our show? What's it like to live and work uh, in Singapore? And we're gonna divide that up into live and work. So the first thing is live, you know, John is a local, a local guy, that's what John is. And he's found himself uh, halfway around the world in Singapore, which has a population of something in the order of three times uh, all of Hawaii, which is not that big. Um, and it's uh, really small, it's 700 uh, square miles. It's pretty, it's pretty small. Um, and um, so there we are with 5 million people crammed in 742 miles. That's pretty impressive. And uh, everybody seems to get along. The place is very clean. Uh, the place is prosperous, even in the time of COVID. Um, and John's doing great. And I just want to know what life is like for John in Singapore versus what it has been like in, in Hawaii. So welcome to the show, John. Thank you, Jay. It's, uh, it's good, to be, good to be on and uh, appreciate you having me here to share a little bit of, uh, I guess, life across the Pacific. Yeah, really a long way with the 26 hours or 28 hours flight. It's a long yeah. way. <laughs> anyway, so um, let's talk about, you know, what it's like to be there. I mean, uh, I was there, but it's probably mm, mm, 10 years ago or more. And uh, I have to say that I really enjoyed it a lot. Um, I thought it was, uh, it was a, a really easy place to live and especially eat. Eating was good. Um, but, but here we are and you're living in the time of COVID. Um, and I guess the question, the primary question I think everybody wants to know is how is life in Singapore in the time of COVID? And um, you know, what, what's it like for the people? What's it like for you? Yeah, sure. I guess maybe just to provide a bit of background. Um, so I was born and raised in, in Hawaii. I grew up in Nuuanu, um, attended Punahou up until fourth grade, and then um, went uh, overseas for the rest of my education. Uh, I moved out to Singapore in 2007. So I've been here for about 13 years, just over 13 years now. Um, and, you know, as, as you say, you know, Singapore is a really dynamic city, city state. Um, so much has changed in the past 10 years since you were last here. And um, certainly even in, in, in the extended couple of years that I, I came out before you, but um, uh, Singapore never stands still. Uh, even during COVID, I dare say um, we were all locked down, um, but there was clearly a lot of, a lot of action going on behind the scenes. Um, and I think, if I just sort of reflect back on the year, um, we were one of the first countries to, um, I guess, receive the virus, uh, to be infected, as it were. Um, Singapore has a roaring trade with China, and we, we're essentially a, you know, an international transport hub. We have you know, millions and millions of people coming through, or we used to have millions and millions of people coming through. Um, our airport every single day and, and obviously you know, the end result was that we were exposed to the virus very early on. Um, I think it was March, first or second week of March when, um, you know, I guess the numbers started picking up and the government sort of went into rapid response declaring uh, Dorscon Orange, which was like a, you know, a sort of risk assessment level, which hadn't been in place since SARS back in 2003. But I guess the big difference between then and now, and you know, perhaps lessons that Hawaii or the US or any other developed nation can learn is to, is to learn from the past and to put in place um, new measures and systems uh, so that you're better prepared for when these um, pandemics occur in the future. So I think you know, our health system, our, our public response system, I guess had um, evolved significantly since 2003, since SARS had, had last sort of hit the island. And so, you know, the government had a sort of framework from which to operate. And it was tough at first. And, you know, at that point, I guess the spread of COVID-19 was still pretty much um, isolated to this part of the world outside of China. You had it in Hong Kong, you had it in Singapore. It was slowly kind of expanding to neighboring nations, but it really hadn't hit the West. Um, 
and there was there was a lot of I guess you know uncertainty. There was a lot of I guess um, yeah. From from my from my position here, um, we reacted quickly. You know, the government put in place a number of um, sort of response um, systems to you know stop working in the office and minimize sort of public transport and cut down on sort of conventions and obviously uh, hindsight is 2020 and we've, we've learned and we've evolved and iterated along the way. But um, I think the best thing that's come out of it, or, or I guess what's helped us get to this sort of point where we can kind of see a light at the end of the tunnel is uh, a, a clear and coherent um, direction from policymakers, which, um, yeah, I will refrain from comment, but um, at least that's, that's kind of been the experience here in Singapore. Yeah, well, uh, so to drill down and unpack a little of that, you know, uh, in the U.S., um, you have uh, you have confusion at the top, and um, you have people all over the country who mm, reject whatever the you know the common knowledge is, the science, the scientific knowledge, and as a result, we you know we've had a really bad pandemic in the United States. It's really percentage-wise worse than the world, um, and that, I think that's largely government. Um, I always felt that Singapore had a smart government back to the time of Lee Kuan Yew, um, you know, smart and also capable of implementing policy. I mean, for example, uh, Singapore is the cleanest place probably in, in you know, in, in the universe. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, and of course, you know, we've all heard the thing about chewing gum and getting cane, but, but it actually is a very clean place. And you don't get to be a clean place unless you have mechanisms to enforce the rules. Otherwise, people take advantage. So I would guess that in the case of COVID, if somebody said you got to wear a mask, then you're bloody well better wear a mask or else. Am I right? Exactly. I mean, you know, in the past, you, you've heard sort of criticisms um, and, you know, naysayers about the sort of pedantics or the sort of heavy-handed approach perhaps by the Singapore government having lived here for 13 years I mean look I full disclosure I've drunk the Kool-Aid um I'm you know I'm like I bought into the story but you know what I think this is a great place to live I wouldn't have stayed here if it wasn't um but yeah to your point it's you know it's transparency it's clarity of direction it's cohesion at the top um, it's admitting your mistakes. Um, you know, if th there was a lot of, I guess, confusion a little, or, or, or I guess, um, lack of clarity or confirmation in terms of, you know, having to wear a mask, at, at least in the first couple of weeks. And obviously the government, whilst trying to manage the pandemic and the sort of the, you know, the, the continued spread, is also sort of playing its role in trying to, you know, look after its its citizens and and ensuring their well-being and their sensitivities, but at the same time, ultimately looking after the sort of the health uh, when it comes down to it. So that you know, I, I think what I'm trying to say is they were sympathetic to, um, you know, the needs of special uh, of populations in society, whether it's the elderly or the children, and so there wasn't like a it wasn't like a sort of didactic sort of you must wear masks from day one. However, when it became, when it became clear that there was you know, scientific evidence to prevent the spread of disease um, through the air, then it was a very sort of clearly worded message. Um, everyone needs to wear a mask. And this is what happens if you don't. You will be fined, you know, first time offender, you know, $300. And that sort of escalates up to $1,000. Oh, boy. <laughs> so, like suck it up, wear a mask, <laughs> like do, do your part for the betterment of society. You know, this isn't about your right to breathe air. Um, like, I mean, I, I've, I've heard the, you know, the news clips that were coming out from other states in, in the union and just like, yeah. it, it, it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, when, I, when I did uh, visit Singapore and I saw you then 10 years ago, um, I went to see a, a fellow named Dwayne Gubler. Uh, he's a doctor. He's an infectious disease expert out of NIH back when, uh, a world known, a world, a world, a world expert in infectious diseases, mostly tropical infectious diseases, and and he was uh, here in Hawaii, and uh, he did not, 
he did he did not realize uh, the promise of his uh, of his appointment at the uh, John A. Burns School of Medicine, and uh, uh, he was um, disappointed in that. And he left and took a job at Duke, at Duke in Singapore. And this is why I met him there in Singapore, and they treated him so well. They gave him all the researchers, all the facilities, everything he wanted. Uh, we had him on the show not too long ago about COVID, I might add. Um, and it struck me that Singapore was, understood fully well how important it was to have medical expertise, epidemiological expertise. And so they would support, and Duke was supported, that's Duke, you know, the American University with, with facilities in Singapore. So Singapore encouraged Duke to come and Singapore and Duke, the, what is it, the National University of Singapore, NUS, they encouraged um, uh, Dwayne Gubler to come. As a result, um, Singapore has some, you know, globe, global quality infectious disease people. Uh, so, you know, it seems to me that there are experts in Singapore in medicine, um, that it fully understands the need. Singapore needs to, you know, have those experts. Um, and it is, it is scientifically driven. Policy is scientifically driven in Singapore. And I think, I, I think that's what I hear you saying. Yeah, and you know, I think what you're talking about sort of extends beyond simply uh, the healthcare sector or specific industry. I mean, it's reflective generally, if I can, I guess, share my thoughts around here. You know, the evolution of Singapore over the past 55 years, you know, the nation was, um, became independent in 65 after it broke away from Malaysia. And um, you mentioned Lee Kuan Yew, the founding father um, previously, you know, setting that vision, setting the, the tone for what policy would look like in Singapore um, in the future. And again, I think as a young nation, it's, it's had to sort of recognize its, um, shortcomings, whether it's sort of intellectual or resource, um, you know, geopolitical, et cetera, et cetera, and act proactively in sort of solving for that. So whether that's, you know, the health and safety of its citizens by bringing in sort of best in class researchers and the medical um, profession to build up our own uh, sort of infrastructure and, and knowledge base. The same can be said uh, about many other industries, you know, financial, um, now technology. I mean, even to the point, I mean, this is my own sort of passion project, but, you know, we're trying to solve um, food security uh, for Singapore, but it goes, you know, beyond Singapore. It goes, um, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, sustainability of the food system over the next 10, 20 years, uh, which I guess, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic has really shone a light on. Um, Singapore is trying to, I guess, position itself and reinvent itself um, to you know, latch onto new opportunities, new industries, new needs for society, global society. Uh, you know, we, we cannot sort of stand by, I mean, as you mentioned at the start in your introduction, it's a tiny little island state, you know, a third, maybe a quarter the size of Oahu with a population nearly four times the size. You know, it's got one of the highest um, you know, urban densities on, on the planet. Yet at the same time, GDP per capita is also one of the highest. So it's done very well for itself in the past um, 50 odd years of independence. But there's, you know, enormous challenges ahead for, you know, the next 50 years for, for Singapore to be getting to what, what they'll call SG100 celebrations. Um, and, you know, part of the reason why, you know, I've decided to stay here for so long and, you know, have made my home in Singapore is that I believe that you know, the, the policymakers and the ones who are sort of plotting the course of the nation um, ultimately have their citizens um, at heart and in mind. So. Yeah. Oh, it's a really extraordinary how, you know, if you watch the policies and watch the moves that Singapore makes uh, from the time of Lee Kuan Yew on forward, uh, been smart, always smart, you know, and uh, achieved fantastic, fantastic achievements. Um, you know, here's a, here's a country, a nation state, with uh, very few natural resources, uh, and yet it manufactures electronics. Uh, it has more trade and shipping than you can shake a stick at. It is a hub in, in Asia and the world, and it, and it retains that. It, it keeps on trucking year after year, and, 
And my guess is it'll it'll make that hundred hundredth birthday without any problem and be better off. And I'll I'll take another guess and say you'll be part of bringing it to that point. And I want to tell you that in the early days of think tech, one of the things we were really interested in, and um, in those days it was a hot topic, not only um, you know in the world but also in Hawaii, and it was uh, aquaponics, uh, aquaculture, um, and the idea was uh, you know to create food. Um, and one of the one of the, the the centers, if you will, I guess this is before you went to live there. Uh, one of the centers was um, this building in Singapore, where um, the, you you grew food, you grew you grew produce uh, along the sides of this glass round building, and you could feed a lot of people with this one building. Um, by just growing produce in, in these special receptacles along around the building. And it, it was world famous for that. Um, then there were other places in the US and in Europe that were doing it, not, perhaps not at the same level of science or scope. Um, and I wondered, you know, A, do you know about this? Uh, is this happening? And, and B, this is the big one. To what extent are you part of that, John? <laughs> I think like... Um you know, many other uh, sort of innovative industries and, and sort of advances in technology, you know, there's a time and place. And perhaps I think what you're referring to, um, unfortunately may not exist today, this particular structure. Maybe, you know, let's think about sort of clean tech revolution and sort of renewable energies and stuff like that. And the amount of investment that went into that space in the early 2000s and it all kind of fizzled out and yet, here it is sort of receiving new life under new potential administration and, and renewed focus. Um, going back to, you know, the sort of the, the food story and, and actually the um, ministry has come out and, and declared 2020 as, you know, the, the Singapore, the year of Sing the Singapore food story. If it wasn't for COVID-19 and, and the need to respond to this like extraordinary um, challenge, there would be a lot more, I guess, going on about, you know, Singapore food story and, and I guess tying that back to a, a very bold ambitious target which um, again the Singapore government set for itself last year in 2019 they declared a or, or they they established a campaign called 30 by 30 um, which means um, they have set out the goal to produce 30 percent of um, domestic uh, or I should say national nutritional needs by the year 2030. And, and right now the statistics are actually surprisingly quite similar to Hawaii uh, in terms of you know, the amount of imports that we rely on. I mean, it makes more sense perhaps in Singapore, we rely on approximately 90% of, of imports um, to feed us. Uh, I mean, the fact that that statistic is similar still, still to Hawaii kind of um, baffles me. But, um, <laughs> but uh, needless to say, I mean, you know, agriculture as an industry has, for the last 20, 30 years, as Singapore has evolved and focused more on, um, I guess, downstream manufacturing and higher value added sectors, you know, agriculture has diminished down to you know, less than 1% of GDP. Now, bring that forward to the present day and faced with climate change and supply chain disruptions as we've all experienced during COVID, Singapore as a nation, nation state is really trying to figure out, all right, how do we survive? Not just, you know, politics and, and COVID, but like, how do we continue to feed our people over the next 20 to 30 years? You know, we are situated right in the center of Southeast Asia, which is going to be, you know, one of the most bustling, um, economically vibrant, uh, corners of the planet um, over the next 10, 20 years. You know, as a region, as a whole, you know, population growth in the next 10 years is going to be 250 million. That's like the, it's the equivalent of another Indonesia popping up in you know, our sort of backyard around, around Singapore. And so you know, when Singapore as an island relies on 90% of its food imports uh, and we've suffered all these sort of you know, border control risks during COVID, we're thinking to ourselves, well, geez, you know, can't go on living like that. That's just not safe and secure. So going back to topic, 
Um, there's been a, a really strong movement sort of supported by and, and sort of driven by government to encourage innovative um, solutions for food production in the island, whether that's, um, you mentioned aquaculture, obviously, you know, the seafood industry in Southeast Asia is, is enormous, but we cannot continue to, you know, fish. I'm, I'm, I will refrain from using any uh, stronger verbs there, but we cannot continue fishing the seas in the same manner as we have done for the past however many decades, centuries. We will literally run out of fish to eat. Same thing with, you know, on ground agriculture. We cannot continue to rely on methods uh, and sort of producing our food through systems that we've sort of relied upon for the past 50 years when faced with climate change and rising population and constraints of natural resources. This is not just. Um, this is not something unique to Singapore. This is a global uh, sort of situation which uh, we as, a, we as a, um, a species are facing and we need to help solve. So Singapore has been very proactive in what it's doing um, in helping to solve that, not just for its population, but also for the region around us. Again, going back to your point about, I guess, the evolution of industry and how Singapore continues to reinvent itself. Um, we see a real opportunity to create intellectual property to build new companies and solutions in the area of whether it's water purification or food manufacturing, protein production, urban agriculture, and sort of, you know, leafy greens, et cetera. All of this is now really starting to come up to the surface. And we've seen, you know, we've been inspired by um, really exciting and, and, and incredible advances in agriculture technology and food technology, which have which has really been, been driven by the West, by the US and by Europe. And now those are starting to be sort of, those ideas and those technologies are being exported and adapted around the world. Um, you know, we see these sort of food hubs springing up in the Netherlands, in Israel, and now, you know, Singapore hopes to be that sort of food hub for the future uh, for Southeast Asia. Yeah, if you, if you have the high technology, you don't need that much space to do it. Um, and so um, you can you can create food uh, with um, you know this kind of technology and not only be well fed but export it to other places. This is the future of the world. So you know you're, you're in the right place, John. And Ag Fund, I, I take it Ag Fund is a, a company that you're associated with. And Ag Fund, I take it is doing that. Yeah. So Ag Fund are actually started off uh, in Silicon Valley. So AgFunder itself is an American uh, venture capital firm. Um, the, I guess the opportunity that the founders saw back in 2013 was basically just a blank space. Um, you know, uh, statistics or a report from Deloitte in 2015 um, exposed that, you know, within the entire venture capital uh, investment space, less than 3% of um, dollar value of investments was going into agriculture technology. And again, this is, you know, supporting innovative technologies, entrepreneurs, startups, which are trying to solve these big questions around food production and sustainability of the food system. This is an industry which employs over 40% of the global population and really upon which we all rely for our daily sustenance. And yet, you know, the numbers clearly didn't match up in terms of you know, investing in and supporting that change. So that was, I guess, the, the blank space that Michael Dean and Rob Leclerc identified when they were setting up Ag Funder in Silicon Valley back in 2013. Um, they set up a news portal and, and have created like a, a community, really, an ecosystem for anywhere from investors, corporates, researchers, policymakers, just to learn more about um, exciting and innovative technology that was emerging in this particular industry and how it was being applied, who, you know, which sort of corporations might want to um, pilot some of these projects, acquire them to into their own sort of business lines, et cetera, et cetera. So that was the sort of genesis of Ag Funder. Um, along the way, and I think this is definitely what resonates with me uh, coming from the investment banking background, is the need to educate more investors around you know, the opportunity, both from a commercial perspective, but also again, uh, kind of a philosophical um, argument around you know, 
how do you invest your money? How do you channel your money into towards sort of more impactful um, investments? And so that was very much kind of part of the mission of, of Ag Funder to create a platform to educate as well as to funnel investments into this particular sector. So that's, um, that's what we're doing at Ag, Fund, at Ag Funder. Um, the company sort of expanded its operations, its geographic footprint uh, to this part of the world just last year, which is when I got involved. Um, you know, let's say the stars aligned. It was when I was uh, looking for my next sort of move out from the investment banking space. Um, I had been working in public markets for over a decade and was looking for, you know, stronger alignment in terms of, I guess, um, what I was spending my time doing, the types of products, the types of investments that I was focused on. And again, it was kind of this question of um, what, are the big que what are the big challenges of the future? Uh, where is the opportunity set? What, where, where are the needs for society? And if I could personally be a part of that and help lend my voice to this conversation, um, then that was something which really excited me. Ah, oh, what a wonderful, what a wonderful career that would be. So do you have facilities and companies that are actually starting up uh, in Singapore? And part B of that question is, uh, is Singapore going to be a hub as it is for so many things to develop these, these companies elsewhere in, in Southeast Asia? Um, yes and yes, I guess in a nutshell. Uh, as, as an investment firm and as a platform, Ag Funder is truly global. Part of our operations um, include a sort of media channel, agfundernews.com. We have reporters across four continents. We are creating content. We are researching and, and writing about, you know, the innovations that are taking place in the agri-food system. Um, we write research reports, free research reports. So if anyone is interested in, please, uh, you know, feel free to drop me a line afterwards. Um, you know, just talking about, I guess, the growth and the evolution of this space. Um, we invest globally. We have, um, we're raising our fifth fund. Um, we are investing in obviously early stage entrepreneurs who are really trying to make a difference um, in the agri food system. Um, you know, back in 2013, when Ag Funder started, the majority of our deal flow was focused on North America, like 90%, I believe. To this day, or at least in 2019, I think it probably North American deal flow probably accounts for about 40%. Um, when we started operations here in Singapore and we um, selected our first cohort into the an accelerator program, which we've set up here in, in Singapore, um, majority of the applications still came from overseas. We had about five applications from Singapore, um, big growth in India and more established agriculture sort of nations in in asia so thailand vietnam india obviously um you know over the past 12 months just to sort of give some reflection on the the, the rapid evolution in this space you know we just concluded a uh, sort of more asia asia pacific focused program where you know we received uh close to 50 applications from singapore startups and uh, I guess, uh, full disclosure, the, the, the particular um, theme of this, this program was focused more around the needs of the Singapore food system. So it was you know, urban farming, um, alternative protein production, uh, supply chain innovation, et cetera, et cetera. But just you know, to see the application number, like you know, 10X in just a period of 12 months was really, really exciting for a geography which hasn't necessarily focused much on this particular sector um, until now. And now, you know, entrepreneurs, um, professionals from adjacent industries, whether it's manufacturing, whether it's healthcare, you know, they might think about, well, how can I apply my, my learnings and my knowledge and sort of apply it to the food system? So for example, um, you know, stem cell technology, uh, you could be a, you know, a PhD in, in regenerative, regenerative um, biotechnology from the healthcare sector, but now you've got those um, entrepreneurs moving into food tech and exploring the really exciting space of cell-based agriculture, um, you know, proteins of the future, basically. Oh, this is a pivot. This is, a, <laughs> this is really a statement of the future. I just wonder, wonder what thing, you, you're talking about protein creation and uh, 
growing produce such as that facility I mentioned in the in the early 2000s uh, here and elsewhere, uh, or rather in Singapore and elsewhere. But um, does it do, do these are these places linked geographically to good weather? In other words, uh, is it likely that a facility in, in, in which you know these companies are interested would benefit by having sunshine, by having warm weather, um, by having a water? I suppose water is very important to to create food. Uh, and and part B of that question, I love asking you two part questions. Part part B of that question is. Does Hawaii have a chance to get in on this? Right. So I guess my response to that would be no and yes. So <laughs> um, is, is sort of food systems of the future reliant on, uh, you know, resources? I guess that's what we're trying to solve for. We're, we're recognizing that we are faced with, you know, rapidly changing, uh, you know, climate systems and the environment around us. We're, as, uh, you know, an island state or you know a, a city state similar to i guess the resource constraints of it could be jakarta it could be shanghai it could be new york city it could be you know tel aviv anywhere around the world we we need to think um well i guess there's many different i guess topics or, or inspirations whether it's carbon footprint of your supply chain or you know localization of food production to cater to uh, sort of uh, sort of higher sort of demographic of, of society or, you know, the different tastes and consumer profiles. Um, you know, we have to consider rural to urban migration, uh, which is depleting the, um, you know, the manpower, the population base who, the, of the farmers who would be working in the fields and you know, still the, the, the reliance on traditional agriculture to supply our cities. Uh, but going back to your question, Singapore is a, hot place to live you know we average probably what low 90s every single day of the year um you know climate change is hyper real for us i mean in the past 13 years that i've lived here i think the average temperature has risen from 28 degrees centigrade to like 31 on average so whatever like it's you know we have 90 odd percent humidity it's it's real the government's obviously taking very proactive steps about it just earlier um, late last year, earlier this year, they declared a hundred billion dollar, Singapore dollar, 72 billion US dollar plan to tackle climate change. And in part of that, it's, you know, food systems of the future, whether it's controlled environment agriculture or recirculating aquaculture systems where you are growing fish on barges, um, in tanks, you know, with water recirculation. So you don't necessarily rely on a fresh supply or a supply of sort of constant supply of fresh water when you can use filtration systems. You don't necessarily need, um, you know, more temperate climates, 70, 80 degrees like we have in Hawaii to grow leafy greens and kale and bok choy or spinach, you know. These technologies exist whether or not they make they are sort of economically viable is the big question, you know, and we need to solve for that. We need to improve uh, engineering systems. We need to improve whether it's lighting or energy usage. And so that is the challenge now. Um, you know, the idea is there, the initial framework is there, but we need the version 2.0, 3.0 to continue to iterate on these sort of technology systems, whether it's, you know, urban agriculture, vertical farming, um, you know, aquaculture, protein production, et cetera, et cetera. Um, moving on, trying to, uh, you know, move on to part two, you know, does Hawaii stand a chance? I mean, I've, I've seen some really interesting sort of projects that have landed on my plate, which are looking at sort of, you know, the natural resources which are available in Hawaii. And, you know, Hawaii is just blessed with great climate, wonderful, you know, land and soil. Now, you know, I, I'm, I need to be careful about, you know, in terms of let, let us be, I guess, prudent about how we sort of use our land. And, you know, a big part of what I'm trying to solve for is sustainability in the food system. We don't just go and sort of, you know, knock down rainforests and go, you know, launch another cattle farm or something like that. But like, there are technologies available which can be, I guess, uh, made even more productive if located in a place like Hawaii, where you can leverage the the, the abundant sort of natural resources available. 
and then potentially, you know, use that, the location of Hawaii as a showcase. Obviously the fact that it's part of the United States is a phenomenal advantage to anyone who wants to develop technologies and export it more globally. The, you know, the, the regulatory environment, the, 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 the trade um, uh, agreements that are in place for you know, exporting IP, et cetera, et cetera. The, the credibility that comes with developing technology in Hawaii is, is, is phenomenal. There's, a, there's an extraordinary opportunity, I think, in this space and something which I would hope to see um, you know, explored more and you know, creating these sort of bridges of knowledge sharing and uh, all the rest of that between Singapore and Hawaii. I think there's a lot that we can do together. Yes, yes, and you're the guy who understands both places. <clears throat> you're in a wonderful spot, a wonderful vantage place. Anyway, we're out of time, John. Uh, I, I'm, I'm so happy that we got together. And actually, I would like to uh, unpack and drill down on other things you've mentioned. Uh, and I'd like to talk to you more about the technologies involved and you know the miracles that are being achieved and will be achieved. Before we go, though, I just have one other thing I want to confirm. Um, your dad told me that um, there's only one or two cases of COVID now in Singapore. I mean, on a daily basis, you have a very low number of COVID cases. I just want to confirm that um, to be sure I understand because we, we don't have that, um, that good fortune. We're, we're doing hundreds per day. W what is it like in Singapore? Well, I, I just checked my latest update from the gov.sg app. So we get like, you know, twice daily updates. Um, seven were the, was the, the latest number of locally transmitted cases. And then they break that down in terms of cases in the community, you know, new loony imported cases, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, look, despite the low number, everyone is still being very careful. Um, you know, we've started opening up uh, sort of more social activities like restaurants, but you're still limited to five people on a table. I have a family of six. I have to split myself into two tables. Um, but look, it's just, you, you got to be careful. Uh, we realize that this thing, you know, we're, we're not through, we're, we're not through the crisis. There's still risk of, you know, people coming into the island, community infection, et cetera, et cetera. We just have to pull together and, and, you know, suck it up and just cooperate, collaborate and um, yeah, try to be smart and safe. And deal with the new world. Well, well, thank you, John. John Friedman, John William Friedman, more specifically. Thank you for joining us today. It's been wonderful to talk to you. Thanks very much for having me, Jay. Look forward to speaking with you again. The same. Aloha.